Today on The Necessary Entrepreneur, we welcome Keith O'Brien. Keith is a New York Times bestselling author of Paradise Falls, Fly Girls, and Outside Shot, and a finalist for the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing and an award-winning journalist. O'Brien has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Politico, and his stories have also appeared on National Public Radio and This American Life. Keith is currently on tour with his new book, Charlie Hustle, which I happen to have a copy right here, The Rise and Fall of Pete Rose, and The Last Glory Days of Baseball. This is no ordinary sport biography, but cultural history at its finest. What O'Brien shows is that while Pete Rose didn't change, America and baseball did. This is a story of that change. What better place to talk about Pete Rose than right here in Cincinnati, right at the beginning of the baseball season. During the conversation, Keith and I talk about why he decided to write this book, now, his ultimate goal of writing a book, besides finishing it, and what Keith calls the cost of hero worship. We also dig into details about Pete Rose's life beginning when he was a child, the nickname origins of Charlie Hustle, and Pete's gambling scandal, and how it applies today, as well as addiction, and human behavior. Stick around to the end when Keith tells us Pete's biggest regret. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Give us a like, maybe a subscribe, and a comment below. You can purchase a copy of Charlie Hustle anywhere books are sold, or you can order an autographed copy just like I have here from waterstreetbooks.com. I hope you find this as insightful as I did. How could we not be pumped and excited right here in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky to be talking about Pete Rose? And um, you wrote a book, and me seeing this hardback sitting in front of me, there's a lot of stuff in there. So I can't wait to read it myself and hear about it. But Charlie Hustle couldn't have been a better name, right? So you're already a New York Times bestseller. So you're bringing that mind and that perspective and that level of understanding about writing and being an author to this, and it's the rise and fall of Pete Rose and the last glory days of baseball. Um, I'm excited to hear about your perspective, what you learned today, but that last statement about the glory days of baseball, I'm not the highest level baseball fan, but I grew up here, and so if you grew up in Cincinnati, you're kind of a baseball fan, was your first sport, but it kind of feels like the glory days are past, and I don't know why, so I'm excited to hear about Pete Rose, Charlie Hustle, and uh, the glory days of baseball and gambling and all types of stuff. We can cover it all. Let's go, man. So uh, thank you for coming in and talking about this. Congrats on the new book. Just came out on March the 26th. Uh, I pulled it up. You can find it on Amazon. Paperback, hardback, all the stuff. So if you want to come out of pocket for that $26.95, I believe, on Amazon, order it today. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, please do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how? Um, why this book? You're from Cincinnati. You grew up and born and raised in Cincinnati, went to high school here, then went to college in Chicago, and now you live in New Hampshire. Why this book now? I feel like in the last 35 years, as uh, Pete Rose was banned from baseball and then made mistake after mistake after mistake off the field, that we have forgotten why we ever cared about him in the first place. And I believe that's true for most Americans. I believe that's true even for most Cincinnatians and baseball fans. Um, uh, you know, the only reason why anyone ever cares about someone's fall, someone's personal disaster, someone's flaws and foibles is if we ever cared about them to start with. And the fact is that we did. And uh, whether you root for him now, whether you defend him now or not. Um, objectively, Pete Rose lived one of the most fascinating, epic, complex, and controversial lives of any athlete in the 20th century. And so what I wanted to do with the book was go back and tell that whole arc, uh, the rise and the fall, uh, and, and tell that story uh, 
you know, through on the ground reporting, granular reporting, uh, interviews with the people who lived it, thousands of pages of previously unutilized federal court documents, and and just tell that story and let people come to their own conclusions. Because, you know, Pete Rose is is. Uh, it's almost like a political party now. Uh, you're you're with him or you're against him, and I feel like everything that gets written about him is always tinged with judgment on either side. And I'm you know not doing that here. Uh, you know there is no opinion in this book. There is no judgment in this book. I am laying out the story, uh, and 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 people can come to their own conclusions. So it seems like a biography. Well, it is. I think it's. I think it's far more than that. Uh, you know, Pete Rose obviously is this iconic individual, but he lived in this epic world, and it's it's almost a Forrest Gumpian kind of life. He is he is in everything and crosses paths with everyone between 1960 and 1989. Whether we're talking about uh, Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays. Or Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. I mean, it's it, they're all in here. Um, it, it is uh, it is an epic life, uh, and whether you were a name that uh, folks would recognize or not, uh, there is a gravitational pull to Pete Rose's universe. And you, if you were uh, on the fringes of it in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, you often got sucked in, and. Uh, in doing so, at times your life became defined by the time you spent with Pete, whether that was eight years in his inner circle or whether it was one night on a baseball diamond where something went sideways. And um, so it is a biography, but I think it's far more than that. I think it's a, uh, a portrait of a man who lives this epic life, uh, a portrait of the people who get sucked into that life. And and really, too, getting to the subtitle you mentioned, uh, you know, the last glory days of baseball. It's also just a portrait of how the game changed, how America changed, how we all changed uh, in, a, in a span of 30 years. Um, I think about Pete Rose to me was really the 70s and 80s. Right. Like when he really came out and he lived his life. And I remember him from the 80s. I was born in the late 70s. So I, re I remember it, him and Johnny Bench and the big red machine and all this. And so what if Pete Rose were a baseball player and didn't change at all today? We wouldn't even know what to do with Pete Rose today. Um, this, this whole ethos of hustle uh, was real. And they didn't even know what to do with it in the 1960s. And this was a time when every player was playing for the next year's contract. Nobody had multi-year guaranteed deals. Nobody had a guarantee of making more money the following season, including the biggest stars. Uh, they were all playing for the next year's salary. And so this was an era when everybody uh, was playing hard. Uh, you know, hard slides into second base were an everyday occurrence. Uh, you know, guys slamming into catchers at home plate happened a lot too. Uh, and um, so in this world, you think, well, a guy sprinting down to first base on a walk, a guy willing to get into fights at second base, breaking up double plays, a guy slamming into catchers at home plate and sliding head first, well, it, it, that, that would just fit right in. It didn't. Uh, even in the, the 1960s, um, his opponents, his teammates, he, they thought he was nuts. Um, uh, you know, he gets this nickname, Charlie Hustle, which becomes the title of the, my book, uh, because of, of this manner of play. And the, and the nickname is not intended to be a celebration of Pete Rose. Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford uh, give him this name as they're sort of mocking him, like sarcastically. Like, who is this Charlie Hustle? And so, you know, if we didn't know what to make of this guy in the 60s and 70s, we definitely wouldn't know what to make of him today. I, I don't I don't know. I don't know how he would even fit into it. Yeah. He, he doesn't look like an athletic star of today. Just the whole thing. He looks like a normal guy from blue collar Cincinnati. 
That's what he looks like. And that's kind of fascinating to us. Not all the glitz and the glamour. Maybe the wife behind the scenes was that, but it didn't seem like that coming across. Did you dig into the book at all about why he was the way he was? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, that that's one of the key things you're trying to do is answer, answer the why questions. Um, and, and the whole, you know, persona of hustle does begin on the West side of Cincinnati long before anybody knows the name Pete Rose. Uh, and, uh, and it's, and it's, and it's sort of imbued into him by his father, big Pete. And Big Pete was uh, a fairly prominent athlete in Cincinnati in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, he was primarily a football player and, and played in a semi-pro league on the West Side. This was at a time when there was no professional football in Cincinnati. Uh, this was as far as Big Pete Rose could go. Uh, he was uh, uh, a weekend warrior playing football, and then he was a bank teller and bookkeeper uh, downtown. And from the moment young Pete is born in 1941, uh, the father is somewhat obsessed with the, with the boy's future greatness as an athlete. And I did lots of interviews with people who uh, knew the Roses on the West Side in the 40s and 50s. And uh, many interviews with people who grew up with Pete Rose. And... Uh, and, and and they all talked about you know Big Pete and his intensity, uh, and th there was a reason why he probably felt he had to be intense. Uh, you know, one of the things I did for the book was try to unearth photos that we maybe haven't seen before of Pete, and I, I found this incredible photograph of Pete Rose's 1956, 15 year old. Legion ball baseball team that wins a city title and then in doing so gets an opportunity to play in a, in a national tournament as well and wins that too. And the photo is incredible for lots of reasons, uh, starting with that, you know, the kids in the photograph all are from like a two mile square radius on the west side. They're all going to Elder High School, Moeller High School uh, and, and Western Hills High School. Um, and, and there's Pete Rose and, you know, not every 15 year old boy looks like the man he will one day become, uh, right. But Pete does, you can recognize him instantly. He looks just like his future self. And what's notable is his size, you know, on this team of 15 year olds, Pete Rose looks like he could be the bat boy. He looks like he could be the younger brother of almost everybody in the photograph. And uh, and he's not the best player on his on that team either. It's not like he's, you know, this little spark plug that is, you know, driving the whole machine. He's not, he's, he's a part of it. And, uh, and, and so he knows from a young age that he, he can't, uh, he can't uh, rest on any laurels. He can't, um, you know, take a day off. He's he's got to work harder, and his father is 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 reminding of it, re reminding him of it constantly. And you know, we didn't have a, a word or a phrase to describe Big Pete, you know, back in the '40s and '50s, but we do today, in my opinion. I mean, he he was like one of those crazy sports dads. Uh, Not indifferent from maybe the Williams dad or these people that are really hard drivers. Yeah, right, right. Tiger Woods dad. Yes. So the question is, in society today, we could go off the deep end, which we won't. Um, could we develop a Pete Rose in today's society? Well, certainly, certainly we could. Uh, certainly there are, you know, kids like him out there right now. Uh, the Pete Rose that existed in the 40s and 50s on the west side of Cincinnati, though, wouldn't have made it today. Uh, you know, the Roses probably wouldn't have had the money for the big fancy travel teams that kids play on and travel all over the country and in various tournaments. They, they, they probably wouldn't have the money for that. Uh, and even when little Pete uh, graduates from high school at Western Hills High School and, and gets a shot at the minor leagues, uh, it's, it's at the lowest of the low rungs of the minors. 
Uh, it's, it's a rung of baseball that doesn't even exist anymore uh, as baseball has contracted over the years. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's highly unlikely that today uh, Pete Rose would have even, uh, you know, gotten a minor league contract. Yeah. So maybe the question in the beginning when I asked about where he came from is, do you think, do you have an opinion if it was more nature or nurture? Does that come into play? Him growing up and the person he became? Yeah, you know, I didn't think about it in that way. Uh, I think, I think in almost every scenario with people, it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, y there are lots of examples of of the hard driving father and and then the the son or daughter who rebels against that. Right? He doesn't do that. He 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 is. Uh, listening to the gospel of Big Pete, and he is absorbing it, and he believes it. Uh, so, you know, that is probably a little bit of nature there. And, you know, this isn't really part of the book, but Pete does have a little brother, um, uh, Dave Rose, and Dave was bigger than Pete. You know, Dave had the tools uh, to be a better player. Uh, he was bigger, he was naturally stronger, uh, and, and unlike Pete Rose, uh, the little brother is a hot prospect because by the time he's graduating from high school on the West side, he is Pete Rose's little brother. I know about him. Right. Yeah. So, you know, on paper, it would seem that Dave Rose should be, uh, better than the brother and he's not. So it's easy to use these words like grit, determination, perseverance. It's nice that we have those words in our vocabulary to, to put on a guy like Pete. Maybe those words were developed maybe from guys like that. Yeah, and it is real. Like I said, there is, you know, there there is a, a reality to to the to the hustle persona. But I will say, and it's important, and it's part of it is part of the narrative in my book. Uh, you know, the press, you know, gilds this mythology and, and casts it in bronze for us. Uh, you know, they love him, and they love that story, and and uh, they write it so well and so often. Uh, that it is the only story, you know, that we know about Pete Rose that he uh, that he hustled his way to the top, and 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 there is a, a reason for that too. That is 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 part of human nature. I mean, this story, the Pete Rose story, is the story uh, that Americans like to tell themselves. You know, it's that it's that classic American bedtime story that if you work hard, if you try hard, if you apply yourself, if you hustle, you can overcome anything, you can be anyone. That is the American story. And uh, Pete Rose personified that, he did. And, 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 and the press though, made sure uh, that he did. Was it tough to be um, impartial coming from Cincinnati writing this book? The short answer is no. Um, you know, I've been a, a journalist for uh, over 30 years at this point. Um, you know, I long ago let go of any kind of uh, allegiances uh, to to anyone or anything uh, except for uh, the story, the facts, accuracy, fairness. Uh, so I did not have any any problem in that regard. I will say. This is the first and only book I've ever written where the people in the room, in the dugout, uh, at the racetrack, in the shady you know, uh, shadows, sometimes don't see it the same way. This, the, 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 the people who were eyewitnesses to the same moment uh, or the same conversation or the same bet or the same deal uh, have a different memory of how it went down. And... As I said before, Pete Rose is, you know, sort of a political party now. And and that's true even in his personal life. You know, in interviews I did with with people who know him, uh, you know, there are people who get uh, you know, who, who who give an interview and and I walk away feeling what they had just described. And 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 so for some people, that's the love they have for him. And, and again, Pete Rose has made mistake after mistake after mistake, and this book does not forgive him for any of those mistakes. It's all part of the story, too. But there are people out there uh, who, will, who would walk through a wall of fire for Pete Rose. And, and when you finish an interview with those folks, you do walk away just as a person 
you know, with those uh, f- quotes, memories, stories rattling around in your in your head. Just the same, I would leave interviews with people who have been hurt by Pete Rose and and hurt badly at times and who still carry that hurt uh, inside them decades later and 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 cannot forgive him and will never. And when I would leave those interviews, uh, their thoughts and feelings and quotes and memories are rattling around in, in my mind. And so, you know, uh, the challenge uh, was uh, telling that story uh, in a way that is uh, fair to all, uh, accurate, and 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 sees it uh, ideally, um, you know, with the humanity of of the story, and and that is what it is for me. This is a human story. That's what I was thinking about. How do you take as an impartial journalist, really wanting to tell the truth and the reality of the story and the situation? How do you do it when people feel differently about the same happening? That's that's tough. Well, it is. Yeah. So I mean, you let the reporting guide you. You know, the reporting guides you, and you and you try to get to. Uh, the closest version of the truth. Wow, 2024. <laughs> um, so did you go to Northwestern intending on being a journalist? No. Uh, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to college, and I, uh, I became a history major. Uh, and after a year at college at Northwestern, I did uh, realize that I was interested in journalism, uh, and I did explore uh, switching my majors and, and uh, switching over to the journalism school. And it was possible. But I was going to have to repeat my freshman year, essentially, you know, in order to get the credits I had missed. And so I was going to have to be at Northwestern for five Maybe years. Maybe you would have been the first fifth year student. That's a thing now. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I would have happily stayed for a fifth year. I did love my time there. I did not want to spend another at the time. I believe it was like... Uh, I don't know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. It's way more now. Even that then. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Right there so, on right there on the east side of Chicago. Right uh, down. Is that where Northwestern? It's is in Evanston, okay. north, north of the city. Yeah. I, I I didn't I did not um want to incur yeah. that debt. Uh, so I I I remained a history major, and that's 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 what my degree was in. So how did you find your way to journalism? After college, I just I just started uh you know doing the work. Getting getting jobs, lowest level, start at the bottom. To write articles, local newspapers, things like that. I did, yeah, yeah, and then you know started at the smallest of small newspapers and uh, uh, worked my way up. Uh, my first real full time uh, newspaper job uh, was at the Kankakee, Illinois Daily Journal. Wow, what a name! <laughs> um, how did you? How long did this take to write? This feels like a decade to me, but how long did it take? I began the research for the book in uh, July, August of 2021. So okay. it's in, three years. And it's out now. Okay. So, yeah. Um, you've written other successful books. I don't know what we consider successful, but it feels like to me it's successful. And you've been a New York Times bestseller. If you dig into the weeds, what that is, you have to sell a few books to make that happen. And you bring that with you to this book um, the past two and a half, three years of you developing this and writing it. Have you grown as a journalist and author through that process from you where you already had arrived? Well, well, hopefully so. You know, hopefully, just like you uh, and just like anyone else, hopefully I am getting better at the thing I do. Uh, And uh, I I, I believe I I have grown. you know, I I'm proud of all my books. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's the old author cliche: they're your children. You know, you yeah. love them all uh, <laughs> forever, forever. <laughs> but you know, yeah, just like with your children, uh, your books have different uh, talents and weaknesses, and um, and I am uh, super proud of of this book. Uh, and I will say, it is it is the most personal book I've written. You know, I'm not in the book. This, there's no uh, first person in here. Uh, this is reported narrative nonfiction, just like all of my books. Uh, but you know, I'm from I'm from Cincinnati. I was born and raised here. Uh, I I know, uh, you know, the neighborhood where Pete Rose grew grew up. Uh, 
you know, I, 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 I knew guys like Pete Rose. I played baseball with them too. Um, and, and I know what it felt like to live here in Cincinnati, uh, when, when Pete was at his peak and when Pete was at his lowest, I know exactly what that felt like. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I was born in the seventies. I'm too young to remember the big red machine years, even though I was alive. Uh, you know, but I do remember when Pete Rose returns, uh, traded back to Cincinnati from the Montreal Expos in August 1984. I remember exactly where I was in September 1985 on the night that he set the all-time hit record. I do believe that if you were alive and watching that night, you also remember exactly where you were. And I remember all the feelings in 1989 because by then I'm, you know, I'm a fully cognizant uh, teenager. I'm driving and uh, I'm driving a car and and you know like a lot of baseball fans, I, I traveled the road of feelings about Pete Rose. Yeah, I was going to say, what'd that feel like then going through it as a teenager in 1989 when, when the betting scandal really breaks? Well, right. I mean, so, you know, I think like a lot of people, when the scandal breaks February, March, 1989, it, I find it to be implausible and impossible. You know, Pete Rose is denying that he's bet on baseball and the Reds. And, you know, some guys in New York at Major League Baseball's front office are saying he did. And like a lot of Cincinnatians, like a lot of Reds fans, I think just like a lot of baseball fans, I thought that just can't be true. And there's a, you know, in, in my book, you know, obviously I reported this out in, in detail with interviews with the people who were in New York at that time. And, uh, you know, I tried to do uh, as much reporting as I could around the key moments in this narrative. And one of them is certainly February 1989. Pete Rose gets called to New York for what is then a secret meeting uh, with the outgoing commissioner of baseball, Peter Ubaroth, the incoming commissioner of baseball and current then uh, National League president, Bart Giamatti, and Bart Giamatti's uh, handpicked deputy and good friend, Faye Vincent. And, you know, they have heard, these men, that Rose has been betting on baseball and possibly on the Reds. And, and they just want to ask him, you know, is this true? They want to know what, what they need to get out in front of here. And in, in a boardroom uh, adjacent to Peter Uberoth's office, uh, you know, they exchange pleasantries. They all know each other. You know, it's a bunch of baseball guys sitting around. And after the pleasantries, you know, Faye Vincent, who doesn't know Pete Rose, Faye Vincent, who has just joined Major League Baseball, um, asks him a direct question. You know, have, have you bet on baseball? And Rose's reply, based on my reporting, is no, I, I, I wouldn't be that stupid. It's convincing in the room that day uh, to, to, to these guys who are, you know, uh, executive level, right. Program mm -hmm. two to be skeptical in this mm -hmm. moment. It's convincing. They believe P Rose. And, and I, I, I bring up that story now to say, I too believed Pete Rose in those early weeks. There's the, he couldn't be that stupid. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it is the cardinal rule of baseball. It is the rule that is uh, on a placard on every clubhouse door or wall. Pete Rose uh, saw it uh, outside the door to the clubhouse of the Cincinnati Reds uh, home uh, locker room uh, probably a kajillion times. Uh, and so it did seem impossible. But I do also remember the other feelings that would come that spring, summer. And again, because I was 16 years old by that point, and reading the newspapers, and and you know, uh, and 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 you know, clearly seeing the story, I remember when Major League Baseball releases its uh, its report, uh, the the famous quote Dowd report, which was named after uh, the lead investigator John Dowd, a man who I also interviewed at length many times, and. Uh, you know, the Dowd report is released uh, in June uh, 1989, so four months into the scandal. And it wasn't released uh, willingly. Uh, it's released uh, by a court order. Uh, the press has asked for it. 
and filed a court order saying this needs to be made public and uh, a judge rules that indeed it does. And so this report comes out. And I think anyone who read the report objectively at the time uh, had to believe that Rose wasn't telling the full truth. You know, uh, this is a report that was based on phone records and bank records, uh, over a hundred interviews with people, and most importantly, uh, depositions with uh, one man who placed Pete's bets on baseball and a bookie who took those bets on baseball. And so, you know, when I say I traveled the road of feelings on Pete Rose, I mean, I traveled them that year in 1989. When he's banned in 89, a couple months later, uh, you know, still denying the truth of the report, still denying that he ever bet on baseball. I now, as a 16-year-old fan, I, I don't believe that anymore. Yeah. So that brings us to modern present times. It just so happens, I don't know if you knew this was going to happen if you're a time traveler, but there's a new possible betting scandal happening in baseball right now. And Pete, with a buddy of his, I believe in Las Vegas, last week or something, had something to say about it. And Shohei and Otani, sorry. That's okay. He, um, I guess, the highest paid baseball player ever, it seems like, with the contract you just signed. Um, his interpreter, it is claimed, who knows what the report's going to say, that either his interpreter was betting and the player paid his losses possibly. We don't know what the full story is yet. But then Pete says, you've probably seen it, I saw it on Twitter a few days ago, he said, well, if I would have had an interpreter, I'd be in the Hall of Fame. Can you break that down? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that that's a viral video that Pete posts, and uh, it was classic Pete Rose. I was sort of waiting for him to to inject himself into the story. He, he, he couldn't help himself. And it's a great joke. It's a good line. Uh, I wish I'd had an interpreter in the 1970s and 80s. I would have gotten off scot-free. That's good stuff. And, it, and the video does what the, the video was intended to do. We're talking about it. It goes viral. But here's the thing. Pete Rose didn't have an interpreter in the 70s and 80s, but he did have inner circle guys, his close pals, his guy who was at his shoulder every day, all day. And, and it was those men who were placing Pete's bets. It was those men who were placing his bets with bookies on baseball, paying his debts, uh, it, it, with bags full of money, collecting his debts and bags, uh, collecting his winnings in bags full of money. Uh, Pete Rose very rarely personally interacted uh, with, with the bookies that he used. Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 it sort of falls short in that way. Um, and, and, you know, about the Otani situation in general, I mean, what we don't know about what has happened here could fill the entirety of Dodger Stadium right now. Um, we simply have no idea uh, what has happened in Southern California with this alleged illegal bookie and alleged gambling debts of $4.5 million. My goodness. We, we don't know. Uh, I, but it will be interesting to see what happens next because yeah. there is a roadmap for what happens next. And it's, it is the Pete Rose story. And there, there are parallels here again and again and again. And, and we, we could talk about those parallels. There's, there's so many historic parallels to what happened uh, 35 years ago and what is happening now. And in my opinion, regardless of where this heads, it is already uh, the biggest gambling scandal that baseball has faced since uh, 1989 and Pete Rose. So do you think now where gambling is so much more prevalent in the country, it's legal in so many states, we're doing it on apps now on sports betting, is it changing what's okay and how close the people are to the players now? It's absolutely changing everything. I mean, just think about how we consume sports now. Think about how we watch sports now. I mean, I don't know about you, Mark, but I, I have a legal betting app on my phone. And I sometimes use that legal betting app to place small bets on a game that I might be watching. Uh, it is fundamentally changing everything. And, you know, the money is absurd. 
How's that going to change maybe even how we look at the player? Would we look at Pete? Would we have looked at him as less harmful today because everyone's betting out in the open? So, obviously, if a player were to do today what Pete Rose did in 1989, placing bets on his own games, even on his own games to win, uh, that's against the rules. Uh, it, it does compromise the integrity of the game. Uh, and, and that player would face uh, the same banishment that Pete Rose does. But to your question, I do believe it is different now. And uh, the test of it will come probably soon. And I don't mean um, with the Shohei Otani situation There's directly. multiple things. I'm, I'm just, if you pay attention to the sports world and you ever pull up ESPN or all these places. There's there's things out there consistently now. Oh. I don't have any examples, but this player and this person's being it's all over the place. Oh, the headlines even the last couple of weeks. It's not just Major League Baseball. It's in basketball, it's every yeah. Yeah, it, there's a there's an investigation in college basketball right now. There's an investigation in the NBA right now. Yep. Obviously the Shohei Otani situation right now. It and and these headlines are just sprinkled into the sports pages. Uh, whereas 35 years ago, it would have been front page, bold print, top of the fold, you know, uh, three inch headlines. And now it's just another gambling scandal. And I do think there will come a time, possibly soon, where a big name player, okay, not not a backup linebacker, not a uh, a punt returner, uh, not a, um, a you know a guy coming off the bench in the NBA a big name is going to get involved in something here, placing bets on him or herself. And that will be the test. That will be the test of how our cultural acceptance of gambling has changed. And, 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 you know, it, it may even come up in the Shohei Otani situation. Now, you know, major league baseball has opened an investigation into what has happened uh, in Los Angeles in and around the Dodgers locker room. You know, when baseball did this in 1989, they pulled out all the stops. Uh, they hired an outside counsel, independent counsel, uh, who was, by the way, highly overqualified, and I say that with respect, to take on this case. Uh, John Dowd, the man I mentioned before, was a former Justice Department uh, attorney. He had unraveled cases that led to indictments of real mobsters and corrupt politicians. Uh, Dowd uh, told me and has said to others before that the Pete Rose case was one of the easiest cases he ever took on because, you know, the lies were right there on the surface. So Major League Baseball hires this man who is uh, incredibly experienced. He has a team of investigators, including former FBI agents. And in a span of 10 weeks, uh, they, they unravel years and years of lies uh, and, and produce a report uh, that is a stunning, uh, a stunningly accurate first draft of history with thousands of pages of of documents and exhibits. I mean, it, it's 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 an amazing it's an amazing amount of evidence. Is that what Major League Baseball is going to do now? That's the question. Will it be the same? I don't know. They've revealed very little about about how they're pursuing this uh, this case and the allegations, and and I and I'm not casting um, doubt on what they're doing. I do believe Major League Baseball has to do uh, a real investigation here. You know, uh, Shohei Otani's interpreter wasn't just his friend, wasn't just the guy, uh, you know, translating the questions in the moment uh, at the press conferences. Uh, Ipe Mizuhara was an employee of the Los Angeles Dodgers. So the, the investigation will be, will be real. But what appetite do we have? for a months long investigation. And I mean, by we, I mean the public, the fans, even baseball, in a world where, you know, gambling is far more acceptable. You know, in the 1970s and 80s, you had to know a bookie. Yeah, that was the only way. And, and not all of us did. Yeah. Most people didn't. Yeah. And even if you did know a bookie or the guy you played golf with had a bookie, it was always a little shady and there were, you, you would be nervous. It was against the law. It was against the law, and you would be nervous as a, a stand-up person uh, selling insurance. or To be found out. Right. 
or or to get in debt to some guy you don't know, right? So, yeah. So what are you going to do if you place a three thousand dollar bet with him and you win and he doesn't pay you? Are you going to call someone? You're not going to call anyone. Exactly. All right? kinds of problems, yeah. right? And now, yeah. and now, all of these people, myself, others, we can just download the app, upload our credit card, uh, place our bets, and watch the game. That's wild. And we're in our couch, on our couch, in our pajamas, right? I mean, it's it. It it is fundamentally different. Um, is it is it the right question or wrong question to ask? Why did Pete? Why did he do it? No, it's not the it's not the wrong question to ask. It, the 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 why was the core of many of my questions with Pete uh, when it came to key junctures. Uh, I can tell you directly how he answered that question to me. Uh, you know, why, why did you do it? Why did you bet on baseball? Why would you take that risk knowing what you could lose? And his answer, you know, was simple. Uh, he said, I thought I wouldn't get caught. And that's so devastating for people that love the Reds and hung part of our identity and who you can become that you spoke to earlier. That's devastating. That's the way it feels. What well, is devastating, and and I do think while that answer is is real and genuine from Pete, uh, I do think there are layers to it that that he he doesn't talk about and that he wouldn't want to say. Uh, yeah, I do believe he thought he could get away with it. He uh, had been betting with bookies for uh, probably over fifteen years by the time he gets in trouble in eighty nine for betting on baseball. Uh, and he had been doing it primarily uh, for most of those years with friends, with people he knew, a West Side bookie, a pal, a friend of the family. Uh, for years, the, the man placing his bets uh, it was a man that I interviewed at length many times, Tommy Giosa. Tommy Giosa loved Pete Rose then. He still loves him now. Uh, you know, Tommy wasn't going to turn on Pete. Problem is, you know, in a, in a world where you're gambling as much as thirty thousand dollars a day, which what Pete Rose was doing, based on my reporting, at times it gets messy, and it gets messy quickly. And what do people like to have arguments about? What do people have fallouts about? Money, and so things start to go sideways, and you know Tommy is sort of cast out of the inner circle. And now he's betting on uh, sports with people he doesn't really know. They don't care about Pete Rose uh, in the way that others once did. Pete's you know, woefully unaware of this fact. Um, and, and, and all of those things are important, but there is another thing. Uh, Pete has given conflicting statements over the years about whether or not he was ever addicted to gambling. Without question based on my reporting and the interviews I did for my book, uh, he was absolutely addicted to gambling by the mid-1980s. Everybody who was in his inner circle, everybody who had a front seat to his behaviors in, in the mid-1980s told me that he was out of control. There was nothing they could do to stop it. He was like a plane uh, coming down out of the sky. And, you know... People, you know, may not know in their personal lives a gambling addict, but I think lots of us have had to deal with addiction in our families, maybe with ourselves, and and we know that the 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 first thing that an addict will do when confronted with the problem by others is to lie, and so you know Pete's gotten. A lot of criticism over the decades, rightly so, for for his lies. Uh, you know, those lies hurt lots of people, uh, including himself, including his loved ones, including close friends like Tommy Giosa. Uh, hurt lots of people. Um, but I think there is another reason why he lied. It wasn't just out of pure deception. It wasn't because he is uh, potentially a, a, an inherently bad person. Uh, it wasn't just because he thought he could get away with it. It was because he was an addict. 
And, and I will say, and this is not part of the book, but I have done a lot of reporting around addiction, uh, in, in scientific peer-reviewed journals that study addiction and human behavior, time and again, uh, they say there are two barriers to a gambling addict, specifically a gambling addict seeking help. And the first is shame, and the second is indebtedness. You know, Pete would never admit to shame. He can't be vulnerable like that. It is not how he is wired. But I can tell you, uh, without question, in the 1980s, Pete Rose was in debt to bookies. At times, those, debt, those debts were quite large. And I do believe, you know, when confronted uh, by important men uh, with Ivy League educations and nice suits in a boardroom, in the offices of Major League Baseball on Park Avenue in New York in February 1989, uh, when they ask him if he's been gambling uh, he, and gambling on baseball, he can't say yes. Huh. Why, um, why do things like a Hall of Fame matter? Why do they matter? Because that's still the big thing. Does he belong there or not? Why does it matter? Well, it's a great sports argument. It's fun to talk about. I mean, the whole Hall of Fame thing for every sport is good for sports. Uh, any sport wants to just remain in the conversation. Hall of Fame is great for that. Uh, I think as people, we like to uh, mark time. And, uh, you know, there are Hall of Fames for lots of things. There's Hall of Fame for radio, you know, and uh, it's a way to you know honor people for their achievements. But it's a good question you ask, Mark, because let's just be honest for a second. Uh, the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, was, was conceived and built in the 1930s, about 90 years ago, uh, to be a tourist attraction, to draw people to Cooperstown, uh, to celebrate baseball, uh, and give people a reason to come there. And for decades, not just in the early votes in the 1930s, when Ty Cobb, by the way, is the highest vote getter and the first class of, uh, that was ever inducted. Uh, for decades, there is almost no discussion and almost no ink spilled in any newspaper debating a player's worth as a person uh, for their morality, their decisions, their marriages, whatever. It's not part of the conversation. It's really only much later, in the 1980s, when that begins. And you know, uh, you can look at a couple of cases from the 1980s uh, where guys, uh, players we know, start to pay a price for their behavior off the field. Uh, Ferguson Jenkins, uh, a pitcher for the Cubs, uh, you know, he, he is long denied access to the Hall of Fame, uh, probably mostly because of uh, his, his uh, uh, dealings with cocaine off the field. Keith Hernandez and Dave Parker. I would argue if you go back and you look at their statistics, especially if you look at them compared to the people we are inducting now, in my personal belief, as a baseball fan, and I am not a voter, I think both Keith Hernandez and Dave Parker are Hall of Famers. Uh, both of them uh, are marginal candidates who I think you can make an argument were denied access to the Hall of Fame and still are denied access uh, and because of their dealings off the field again with cocaine. It's only in this time where this starts to happen. And there's one more, you know, Jim Rice. Jim Rice, the uh, Boston Red Sox outfielder right. for the Red Sox. He's in the Hall of Fame now. It took a long time. And do you know what the big argument was? And, and I don't know. The, the press didn't like him. He wasn't very likable. He wasn't friendly. He wasn't accessible. He didn't like to give interviews. He didn't make friends with the press. So he's not in for a long, long time. My personal feeling about all of these things uh, is not part of the book at all. You know, I didn't write Charlie Hustle to make a case for Pete Rose. I didn't write it to make a case against Pete Rose. 
I wrote it because he is objectively one of the most iconic athletes of the 20th century. Uh, and, and I believed that there was uh, more to this story. Uh, that's why I wrote the book. Um, and I don't really, you know, wrestle very much in the book with the Hall of Fame. You know, it's it's in the final pages of the book. It's it's in the reckoning that's still happening about Pete Rose right now. Uh, you know, I sorted out then with reporting uh, with others. Uh, he but, said he ex he's accepted that he's not going to be in until after he dies. I heard him say that. Yeah, I believe so. And. You know, uh, he he has been behaving for the last few years as a man who is not trying to curry favor with the league. He's or, resigned to it. Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, I've never met him. Have you? Yes. Face to face. You had you interviewed him. And yes. Um, he feels like a tortured soul from afar. I could be wrong, but that's the way it feels. It feels when I every time I hear him talk. Every time he puts something out, it just feels like some of the highest level regret and sadness about life that I've felt from a human. I don't know if you have perspective or opinions on that, but that's what it feels from afar. So I think there's some truth in that. You know, Pete Rose is an eternal optimist. He was as a player. He still is today. Uh, I, and I think uh, that quality about him uh, helped him as a player. Uh, you know, he was never in his own head. Uh, you know, what's that line from Bull Durham? Don't think you can only hurt the ball club. P. Rose not thinking. So massive confidence. You know, he he is he he believes at all times things are going to work out for him. He's going to figure this out. He's going to score. He's going to get a hit here. We're going to win. He believes that. And and. That same quality hurt him off the field. You know, he believes I'm going to get out of this. I'm not going to get caught. Oh, now they may have caught me, but they're still not going to get me. Same attitude hurts him there. Um, but he still is an eternal optimist now. And, uh, you know, he likes to uh, project this uh, attitude that, you know, um, he doesn't care anymore about the Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, he's he's moving on without it. Uh, you know, I know both from my interviews with Pete and from my interviews with others who know him, that it's not that simple. Uh, you know, uh, I was just talking the other day to uh, one of his former players. And um, uh, it was about the book and the book coming out and uh, the reception uh, for it. And uh, um, we were talking about th this very question. And this former player said, you know, uh, Pete likes to, um, you know, pr project this, uh, this steeliness about it to the world, but it does, it does bother him. And, and that did come up in one of our interviews. And I remember specifically, you know, one thing he said, because it, it was a, a little haunting and as close as probably one can get uh, to Pete Rose being vulnerable. And he was talking about being denied access and he was to the Hall of Fame, but he was talking more about being ineligible as a player and how he can't be in the Reds locker room and how he can't go to spring training and sit in the batting cage and help a young player with his swing or how he couldn't, he couldn't be there 30 years ago when his young son, you know, was, was, you know, in minor league and major league clubhouses. He couldn't, he couldn't go in there with his kid and how that hurt him and how it still hurts him. And he told me, he said, it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. It's a big statement. Um, is there something, is there one profound thing that you learned from the past two and a half, three years that you didn't know or didn't know you were going to find out or learn? Is there a thing? Because there's many things for all of us in the book, but for you, the author. There's so many things. So it's tough. There's not oh just my gosh. one. Okay. I've learned so much, uh, uh, you know, not just about this story, but about, life uh about people um you know uh you know so what I, about life yeah you know um this idea that your greatest strength can be your greatest weakness is is for me a, a powerful takeaway from the story um i i 
you know, said, uh, you know, a little earlier that, you know, I long ago uh, let go of any allegiances to, you know, uh, teams or people, you know, in the, in the process of doing my job. Uh, but I, I have learned a lot in this book about the costs of hero worship. Um, and not just the fact that we, you know, put Pete on this pedestal and, and it probably never should have been there in the first place. But, you know, people like Tommy Giosa, who I mentioned before, this man who, who was a young kid in his teens and early 20s when he meets Pete Rose and is enamored of him in the way that lots of us would have been in that time. Being that close. Being that close, being in the inner circle, having Pete's attention, uh, you know, getting the keys to his Porsche to go, you know, go run errands. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want that? And, um, you know, in a lot of the media coverage in the in the late 80s about this story, guys like Tommy Giosa, you know, were were described in terms that I I reject and 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 do not use and did not use in the book. You know, they used terms like, you know, hangers on or thugs or low lifes. And I reject that. You know, um, I've spent a lot of time with Tommy Giosa and others uh, who who place Pete's bets on baseball. Uh, they were just young men who were thrilled to have Pete's attention. Uh, were thrilled to be invited to the party. Uh, didn't want the party to end. And yeah, because of that, they were willing to do just about anything for Pete Rose. Mm. What do you uh, do? You do you have goals when you write a book that's going to be this? Um... I think this is going to be a really impactful and substantial book. I, I just think it is. There's a lot of books. I, I went through a local bookstore um, in Newport the other day, and these random bookstores still are pretty cool. A coffee shop and a bookstore. And, and, I, and I was talking to the person I was there with, and I said, so many books, so many books, and so many are written. I just, I'm fascinated, but I think this one is going to have some stick to it. Uh, but do you go into it? with a goal. Well, thank you for, for starters. I, I hope it does. I hope it, I hope it has some legs to it. Um, I, uh, and yeah, you do have goals. Uh, I mean, for starters, y you want to finish. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> to, which sometimes <laughs> doesn't feel, doesn't feel, uh, like a given, uh, it, you know, writers can go to dark places in, in the, in the writing and the editing of the book. Um, you know, I will say like a lot of people and maybe, you know, like a lot of young men, uh, teenagers, you know, I, I grew up, you know, reading things like sports illustrated and I grew up, um, you know, gravitating to narrative nonfiction books about baseball. Uh, you know, uh, David Halberstam, the great David Halberstam is one of, um, one of my literary heroes uh, because he he wrote powerful stories that uh, sometimes took place on a baseball field but were about far more than baseball. Uh, baseball was just like the setting. And if I had a goal with this book besides just finishing and just making it to this moment right now, sitting across from you, it would be to achieve something like that, you know, to uh, uh, to have someone say, you know, this is more than just a baseball book. This is this is this is, this is about life. This is about us, um, and, and that would be my goal. Awesome. Hey, I think uh, I think Cincinnati's gonna be proud, right? Because of regardless of the world and the Hall of Fames and those places, I think I, the city's still proud of a guy who holds a record of the most hits in baseball. That. It might be the record that's never broken. It may be because, you know, I don't know who said it, but records are made to be broken. I don't know how sports are these days. I don't know if that's one's going to be broken. And that's that's hard to say. And so we're, we're I think we're proud of the guy, regardless of how the rest of the world feels about him. And um, to see a book like this come out. And of course, it has the color red on the binding. Um, I think that uh, I think that we're going to be happy you wrote it. So all the energy and the time that you took, and the pain and the suffering getting it here. We didn't talk about that. Um, from Cincinnati, I say thank you. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Mark. It was my pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Uh, how many pages? That looks about a, uh, is that three to 400? Yeah, about that. Yeah. All right, guys. Go buy it. Is 
is the easiest place the the place we go to find things often these days or is there a, is do you have a website is there a publisher is amazon the place uh, Charlie Hustle is available wherever they sell books. There so whether it's Amazon or your local independent bookseller, uh, you can find it anywhere. And if you live here in Cincinnati, I will say I just signed a ton of copies that are sitting at Joseph Beth Booksellers in Rookwood. Uh, so, But you can get it anywhere you can buy but books. But go grab one. I think people, I looked on your website, I think they can go to your website and order a signed copy. You can, yeah. So I have a great independent bookseller in New Hampshire, uh, it's, it's it's called uh, Water Street Books. Okay, and uh, Water Street Books uh, will take orders. I go in there about once a week. Uh, I sign copies, and they go out the door. It's like magic. The book will arrive like magic. And it is your handwritten ink. That's right on the pages. That's right. Um, awesome. Hey, thanks for coming in, and uh, this makes my uh, this makes me smile for the week. So, thanks. Awesome, man. Thank All you right. so much. Yes.